it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. I was stranded in the Australian outback. Something hunted me. By Page Turner 627. Part 1 The morning sun is just beginning to crest the horizon, casting a soft golden glow over Karajini National Park. I feel a mix of excitement and apprehension as I load my land cruiser for my first solo patrol. Check my gear one last time. Radio, check. Map, check. Water and supplies, all accounted for. Climb into the driver's seat and start the engine, the sound breaking the morning stillness. This park, with its rugged terrain and untamed beauty, is now my responsibility. The Australian outback stretches out before me, vast and unyielding. I can't help but think about how far I've come to be here. With a sense of nostalgia, I reach into the glove compartment and pull out a weathered, leather-bound notebook. Flipping it open, greeted by a collage of notes, sketches, and photographs. More than half of the photos feature me and my father in various outdoor settings, snapshots of our shared adventures. My parents divorced when I was just a kid, so my life was split between their two worlds. Growing up, I spent the weekdays with my mum in the stifling urban sprawl of Perth, but the weekends were my escape. My dad would come whisk me away to a different reality. We'd go exploring the national parks all across Western Australia, hiking through dense bushland and camping under starlit skies. The trips were a much-needed escape from the confines of city life and the constant tension between me and my mum's new boyfriend, Mark, a prick who could never seem to hide his disdain for me. The feeling was mutual. As I flip through the images, I see myself growing up, from a curious child in awe of the natural world to a teenager, more confident and assured always by my dad's side. One particular photo catches my eye. It's of me at about nine or ten years old, around the time of the divorce. I'm standing with dad by a serene lake, our smiles as wide as the horizon behind us. We're proudly holding up a fish we'd caught together. I gently turn the photo over. There in my dad's familiar, slanted handwriting is a message that strikes a chord in my heart. The wilderness is where you'll find yourself. The last photo in the collection, taken on the weekend of my 15th birthday, is one I rarely look at, but today I feel compelled to. We're sitting on a rocky outcrop, our faces turned towards the setting sun. Dad's arm is around my shoulders, and I'm leaning into him, a half-smile on my face. But it's his expression that catches my eye. There's a shadow that hangs over him. He was a man haunted by demons that he never spoke with me about, that I was always too afraid to ever ask. Despite the darkness that seemed to cling to him, my love for him was unwavering. His complexities, in a way, made me love him more. He was my rock, my constant in a sea of change. In my heart of hearts, I'd convinced myself that it would always be the two of us, father and daughter, side by side against the world. The crackle of the radio startles me out of my reverie. The voice of my supervisor's familiar, gruff voice fills the cabin. Arnhem... Do you read me? I pick up the radio and press the button, my voice steady but with an undercurrent of anticipation. This is Ranger Arnhem, reading you loud and clear. What's the good word, Big Mike? Uh, just checking in to see if you're all set for your solo excursion, Big Mike replies. Yeah, all good here. Just about to head out. I smile, appreciating his concern. Uh, remember, kiddo, this park's a wild place. Keep your wits about you and don't take any unnecessary risks, he advises. Absolutely. I promise I won't do anything you wouldn't. I reply with a playful tone that elicits a chuckle on the other end. Good. That's what I like to hear. And hey, um, Willow, he adds, a hint of warmth breaking through his usually stoic demeanor. Your old man would be proud of you. You've got this. A lump forms in my throat at his words. In a lot of ways, becoming a park ranger was my attempt to stay connected with my dad in the only way I knew how. Thanks, Big M. I'll report back by late afternoon. Arnhem out, I say, signing off. As I navigate the rugged tracks winding through the park, 
the sun climbs brighter, casting sharp shadows across the red earth. The land is breathtaking, with gorges slicing through the terrain and ancient rock formations standing as silent witnesses to time. Several uneventful hours into my patrol, the landscape unfolds in a familiar rhythm. Red earth, towering gorges, and the occasional wildlife. It's a typical day in Karajini, tranquil yet alive with the whispers of nature. However, as I approach the remote area near Wiano Gorge, something catches my eye. It's a subtle disturbance, a flicker of movement, or a shade out of place. Hard to discern at first, but unmistakably unusual. Wiano Gorge, well known for its breathtaking views, is rarely visited, its beauty guarded by the ruggedness of its terrain. Well, it could be anything. A lost hiker, rare animal sighting, or perhaps just a trigger of the light and shadow. But as a park ranger in this unforgiving expanse, every possibility warrants attention. Curiosity piqued, I decide to take a detour to investigate. The stillness is shattered by an ominous rumble of shifting earth. My eyes dart upwards, catching sight of a massive boulder breaking free from the cliff above. Time seems to slow as I watch it tumble, gaining momentum, its path unmistakably aimed at my land cruiser. My heart pounds in my chest, a primal instinct to survive kicking in. Gripping the steering wheel, I swerve the vehicle with all the might I can muster. The landscape blurs as I make a desperate attempt to evade the impending collision. But the boulder, like a relentless predator, seems to follow my every move. The distance between us rapidly closes, with a final, futile twist of the wheel, I brace for impact. The world erupts into chaos. The deafening crash of metal against stone reverberates through the air. The 4x4 lurches violently, throwing me against my seatbelt as the world outside spins in a dizzying whirl of red dust and shattered glass. The airbags deploy with a force that feels like a punch to my chest and face, their rapid inflation cushioning the brutal impact. For a moment, everything is white and suffocating, the smell of propellant strong in my nostrils. My ears ring from the loud pop of the airbags and the thunderous crash of the boulder. Pain sears through my body as the vehicle comes to a jarring halt, tossed aside like a toy in the wake of the boulder's destructive path. I struggle to catch my breath, the air thick with dust and the acrid scent of burning rubber. I groan, a deep-seated pain throbbing in my head. My hand instinctively goes to my forehead, feeling the wetness of blood seeping through my fingers. Bloody hell, I mutter under my breath, the words barely audible over the ringing in my ears. I try to orient myself amidst the wreckage. The vehicle is crumpled, its frame twisted in an unnatural contortion. My head throbs and my vision swims, but the urgency of the situation propels me forward. I quickly check myself for injuries. Apart from a throbbing pain in my head and a few bruises, I seem okay. The car, however, well, that's another story. It's totaled, a twisted mass of metal and shattered glass, with smoke billowing from the hood. I fumble for the radio, my hands shaking. Base, this is Ranger Arnhem, I croak, hoping the radio survived the crash. Static crackles in response, a sign that communication might still be possible. I've been in an accident near Wiano Gorge. Need immediate assistance. The radio remains silent, leaving me with a sinking feeling of isolation. Panic rises in my chest. I'm tens of kilometers away from the nearest ranger station in a rarely patrolled part of the park. My water supply is limited, with the harsh sun climbing higher. The heat becomes suffocating. The old fear, that gnawing sense of abandonment, starts creeping back, threatening to paralyze me. It's a ghost I thought I'd left behind, but here, in the vastness of the outback, it looms large once more. But I fight against the rising tide of panic. I close my eyes, take a deep breath, and focus on what I can control. You can do this, Willow, I say to myself through clenched teeth. I recall the survival training I underwent as part of my ranger induction, 
the countless hours of first aid, navigation, and emergency response drills. With a grimace, I try to push the car door open. It creaks and resists, a reminder of the full force of the crash. As I exert more pressure, a sharp pain shoots through my arm, causing me to wince. Carefully, I assess my wrist. It's swollen and tender. I suspect it's sprained, maybe even fractured. I awkwardly maneuver out of the driver's seat, grabbing the first aid kit as I do so. Sitting on the ground, I lean against the vehicle, trying to steady my breathing. Give myself a more thorough examination, checking for other injuries I might have missed in the initial shock. The throbbing in my head is intense, and I feel a warm trickle of blood down my temple, maybe a concussion. There's a deep cut on my leg from the collision. It's bleeding, but not profusely. I clean the wounds as best I can with the limited supplies in the kit and bandage them tightly. Pain in my wrist is persistent, but I manage to wrap it in a makeshift splint. As I sit there gathering my thoughts, I remember passing a waterfall a few kilometers away on my patrol route. The thought of its shade and fresh water gives me a sliver of hope in this dire situation. I know I need to get there if I want to increase my chances of survival. Gathering my wits, I turn my attention to the GPS mounted on the dashboard, hoping for a glimmer of guidance. But my heart sinks as I find it damaged beyond use, its screen a spiderweb of cracks, lifeless and unresponsive. I turn to the glove compartment, rummaging through its contents until my fingers find the familiar, slightly worn edges of a map. Laying it flat on the hood of the damaged vehicle, I try to pinpoint my current location. Using landmarks I remember passing, like the distinctive shape of a nearby gorge and the direction I was heading, well, I estimate my position. It's not exact, but it should be close enough. I trace the contours and landmarks with my finger. The waterfall is marked clearly, a blue squiggle amidst a sea of browns and greens. I plot my course, mentally calculating the distance and the direction I need to head. The sun, now a fiery orb in the sky, will be my guide. I need to head east, towards the rising sun, then veer slightly north. Gathering my strength, I stand up, wincing at the sharp pain in my leg and wrist. I grab my backpack and fill it with supplies from the car. Water canteens, emergency rations, a small survival kit, and, most importantly, my notebook. It's not much, but it's something. Put on a pair of sunglasses and a hat to shield myself from the relentless sun. I scour the area around the wreck, searching for anything that could serve as a makeshift walking stick. After a few minutes of searching, I find a sturdy fallen branch. Well, it's not perfect, but it's solid enough to support my weight and help me maintain my balance. The trek is grueling, each step a test of endurance. My sprained wrist throbs with every movement and the cut on my leg stings sharply, but I push through the pain. The rugged terrain is unforgiving, with rocky outcrops and uneven ground making the journey more challenging. As I walk, I can't help but think of my dad. The stories he told me of his adventures in the wild, the tips he gave me for surviving in harsh conditions, they all come flooding back. I realize now how much those weekend excursions with him were not just about bonding, but also about preparing me for moments like this. Every few hundred meters, I come to a stop, taking sips from my canteen, rationing the precious water to make it last as long as possible. The sun relentlessly beats down on me, causing sweat to pour from my brow and evaporate instantly in the arid air. Each pause is also an opportunity to check the compass from my survival kit to ensure that I'm still heading in the right direction. As I trudge on, a nagging sensation begins to gnaw at the edges of my consciousness. It's a feeling of being watched, a prickling at the back of my neck that I can't quite shake off. At first I dismiss it as the jitters, but the feeling persists. I catch fleeting glimpses of shadows moving at the edge of my vision, too quick to be just tricks of the light. Every rustle of the underbrush, every snap of a twig sends a shiver down my spine, as if the landscape itself is watching me, the silent stalker just out of sight. Finally, 
after what seems like an eternity and reach the waterfall. The sound of cascading water is a welcome relief. The shade provided by the surrounding trees offers a respite from the searing sun. A collapse near the water's edge. A crawl towards the water, the sound of it a soothing balm to my frazzled nerves. I carefully unscrew the cap of my canteen and dip it into the clear, cool water, filling it to the brim. Oh, the water is pristine, a lifeline in the unforgiving environment. I take a cautious sip, letting the liquid refresh my parched throat. And the heat is relentless. My body aches for relief. With a deep breath, I begin to strip off my dusty, sweat-soaked clothes. Each movement is a challenge with my injuries, but the thought of the cool water on my skin spurs me on. I leave my clothes in a neat pile on the rocks and step gingerly into the water. Well, the shock of the coolness is immediate, sending shivers through my overheated body. I wade deeper, submerging myself up to my shoulders. The water soothes my aching muscles and the sting of my injuries. I immerse my head, letting the water flow over me, washing away the dust and fear that clung to me since the crash. Floating there, I close my eyes and let the water cradle me, a temporary escape from the pressing reality of my situation. But there's no time to linger. I have to be practical, to think about survival. I emerge from the water and dress, I redo my bandaging, making sure they're secure. While I sit there, drying off in the sun, I start to formulate a plan. I know they'll send out a search party once I don't report back, but with the vastness of the park, it could be a while before they find me. I need to make myself as visible as possible. As the sun begins its descent, painting the sky in hues of orange and pink, I find a suitable spot near the waterfall to set up a temporary camp. I clear the ground of debris and lay down a layer of leaves and branches to sit on. Gathering stones, I create a small circle for a fire, ensuring it's far enough from the trees and brush to prevent any risk of a wildfire. The process of starting a fire is arduous, especially with my injured wrist, but I persevere. Using a lighter from my survival kit, I finally manage to spark a flame. I feed the fire with small twigs and branches, watching as the flames grow stronger. As the temperature drops rapidly, I wrap myself in a thermal blanket, huddling close to the fire's comforting glow. Underneath the star-studded sky, I can't help but feel a sense of vulnerability. The vastness of the wilderness and the isolation it brings are both awe-inspiring and terrifying. Yet the fire serves as a beacon of hope a signal to any rescue aircraft that may be scouring the park for me. As night falls, the sounds of the outback become more pronounced. The distant calls of nocturnal animals, the rustling of leaves in the gentle breeze, and the continuous murmur of the waterfall create a symphony of wilderness. I take out my notebook and a pen from my backpack and start to write. I jot down my location, the details of the accident, and my current situation. I note the direction I walk from the crash site and any landmarks I passed and cross-reference them on my map. After a while, I set aside the notebook and focus on staying warm and alert. I periodically add wood to the fire, ensuring it keeps burning throughout the night. I wrap myself in my thoughts, the crackling of the fire a soothing backdrop, when suddenly a rustling sound cuts through the silence. It's coming from the dense brush just beyond the firelight's reach. I tense up, every muscle in my body on high alert. You've no doubt seen all those memes about how Australian wildlife is out to murder you. While mostly gross exaggerations, there's always a kernel of truth in them. The outback is home to some of the most unique and, yes, potentially dangerous creatures in the world. My mind races through the possibilities. Could it be a snake? A dingo, perhaps? Or something larger? The rustling grows louder more insistent. Then out of the darkness, a figure emerges. For a moment, my heart leaps into my throat. But it's not a predator. It's a joey, a baby kangaroo, a male by the looks of it. His eyes wide with curiosity as he cautiously approaches the firelight. He's far too small to have caused the earlier disturbance in the brush. Hey there, mate, I murmur 
trying to keep my voice steady despite the unease churning in my gut. You're all right. I'm not going to hurt you. Hey, where's your mum? The kangaroo cocks his head slightly, as if considering my words, and then takes a tentative step closer. In that moment, there's a sense of connection, a fleeting bond formed in the wilderness. But the serenity shatters in an instant. The ground beneath me starts trembling, sending ripples through the water. A subtle vibration at first that quickly escalates into a violent shudder. The joey, sensing the danger before I fully grasp it, bolts into the darkness, his powerful legs carrying him swiftly away. For a moment I'm frozen, my mind struggling to make sense of the sudden shift in the peaceful night. Wait! I call out instinctively, though I know the kangaroo is far beyond hearing me. Pushing aside my blanket, I scramble up to my feet, my pain momentarily forgotten in the adrenaline rush. I grab my torch and stumble forward, trying to follow the kangaroo, driven by an inexplicable urge to not be alone in this unsettling moment. Suddenly, the earth in front of me ruptures with a violence that knocks me off of my feet. I scramble backwards, my heart pounding in my chest. And from the fissure in the ground, a nightmarish creature emerges, its form so bizarre and terrifying that my mind struggles to comprehend it. Skin is a grotesque tapestry of oozing, putrid green, brown and grey, resembling a patchwork of rot and decay. Slimy tendrils hang from its grotesque bloated body, swaying with a perverse rhythm. The eyes, glowing a malevolent red, are sunken into its face, framed by sickly, translucent membranes that blink horizontally like the slit pupils of a snake. Frozen in terror, I can only stare as the creature opens its gaping maw, revealing rows of sharp, jagged teeth. A low, guttural growl emanates from its throat vibrating through the air and draining the blood from my face. Well, instinct kicks in, and I know I have to move. I stumble backwards, my injured leg protesting with sharp jabs of pain. The creature lunges forward, its movement surprisingly swift for its size. I dodge to the side, barely avoiding its snapping jaws. I scramble back to the fire, my breath ragged with fear and exertion. The creature is relentless, its every movement filled with predatory purpose. A desperate bid for defense, I grab a flaming branch from the fire, the embers scattering in a shower of sparks. With every ounce of strength I have, I swing the branch at the monster. The flames lick at its grotesque skin, and it recoils with a hideous screech that pierces the night air. The smell of burning flesh and singed hair fills my nostrils, a nauseating reminder of the surreal danger I'm facing. I don't stop to think. I swing the branch again and again, each strike a desperate plea for survival. The monster, though visibly pained by the flames, is undeterred. It snarls and lunges at me with renewed ferocity, its claws swiping through the air, inches from my face. I retreat circling the fire, using it as a barrier between myself and this nightmarish foe. I grab my bag, pivot on my heel, and sprint towards the waterfall, the only refuge I can think of. The creature follows, its guttural roars echoing off the rocky walls. My heart pounds in my ears, drowning out all other sounds except the monster's relentless pursuit. I don't dare look back, focusing only on the path ahead. Reaching the waterfall, I scan the area frantically for any crevice or overhang to hide in. The mist from the fall is thick, shrouding the area in a damp, eerie veil. I can hear the creature's heavy footfalls drawing nearer, the sound growing louder with each passing second. My heart hammers against my ribcage, threatening to burst. In a split second, I dart towards a small overhang near the base of the waterfall. It's a gamble... It's the only chance I have. The ground is slippery, treacherous, and I struggle to maintain my balance as I move. Just as I reach the overhang, a terrifying realization hits me. It's a dead end. The rocky wall looms high, offering no escape. I feel utterly cornered, trapped. 
Creature's growls are now just meters away, its menacing presence looming over me. Panic grips me, the fear so intense it's almost paralyzing. My mind races through every possible scenario, but none offer a way out. I brace myself, ready to face the creature, and suddenly, a pair of strong, calloused hands grabs me from behind, covering my mouth. My initial impulse is to struggle, to fight against this new threat, but the hands are insistent, pulling me towards the cascading waterfall. I plunge into the veil of water, a cold, blinding torrent that disorients me further. Well, is this another threat? Or an unexpected ally? Part 2 As I'm pulled through the cascading waterfall, the cool water envelops me, sending shockwaves through my already exhausted body. The sensation is disorienting, like being caught in a relentless storm. I can hardly see or breathe, but the strong grip on my arms guides me steadily through the torrent. We emerge into a narrow, cramped crevice, hidden behind the waterfall. The space is barely large enough for two people, and I'm pressed close to the stranger in the confined area. The sound of the fall roars just outside, muffling any other noise. The stranger, still gripping my arms, finally releases me and spins me around to face him. I find myself face to face with a young Aboriginal man. His features are strong, weathered by the elements. His eyes are alert, his expression serious but not unkind. He's dressed like a traditional hunter-gatherer, reminiscent of the figures I've seen in history textbooks. His skin is painted with intricate designs, symbols that speak of a deep connection to the land and its law. He's armed with traditional weapons, including a spear and a boomerang, hanging from a belt made of woven plant fibers. He seems like a man out of time. For a moment we just stare at each other, both catching our breath. He gestures to me to stay silent, his finger to his lips. The young man, his movements swift and deliberate, reaches into a small leather pouch at his side. He pours out a handful of fine, ochre-colored powder. Without a word, he spits into the powder, mixing it with practiced ease. He starts smearing the gritty paste over my face, hair, and clothes. His hands are gentle yet efficient, covering every exposed bit of skin. The paste smells like a blend of native plants and herbs, an earthy and almost comforting aroma. As he works, he pauses ever so slightly over my face. There's a flicker of surprise in his eyes, a brief but unmistakable reaction to my fair complexion, so different from his own. But he quickly regains his composure and continues his task. The stranger finishes applying the paste just as the heavy footfalls of the creature grow dangerously close. He draws his spear, his body tensing, ready for the confrontation. His eyes flicker to mine, a silent message to stay quiet and still. Then, piercing through the cacophony, I hear it. A voice so familiar it sends shivers down my spine. My little wren, are you there? It calls, using the secret nickname only my father ever used. The voice is warm comforting, and yet utterly impossible. Every instinct in me wants to rush towards the sound, towards the memory of safety and love that voice represents. I take a step forward, my heart aching with a mixture of hope and disbelief. The stranger's hand grips my arm firmly, holding me back. His eyes, intense and fearful, meet mine. In them I see a warning, a plea not to give in to the illusion. The voice outside, rich and familiar, continues to beckon. That's me, Big Eagle. Don't be afraid. The use of my father's nickname for himself sends a wave of nostalgia and confusion over me. It's as though the past and the present are colliding in this surreal moment. The voice grows more insistent, pleading now. Ah, oh, Willow, please come out. I've missed you, love almost too much to bear, hearing those words from a man I believed was gone forever from my life. The voice outside shifts, 
no longer just my father's, but now intertwined with the soft tones of a woman and the playful chatter of a child. They speak in a language unfamiliar to me, their words flowing like a gentle stream, melodic and haunting. The voices, though soothing, carry an undercurrent of something sinister, an attempt to lure us from our hiding. My companion clenches his jaw, his hand tightens around the shaft of his spear. I see the conflict raging within him, a desperate fight against the urge to respond to these ghostly calls. The creature's snout, a grotesque mix of scales and sinew, pushes through the narrow opening of our hiding place. His breath is hot and fetid, filling the confined space with an oppressive stench. It sniffs around probing closer and closer to where we crouch in silent terror. I hold my breath, trying to make myself as small as possible. The creature's snout comes mere centimeters from my face, its nostrils flaring as it searches for a scent. My heart pounds so loudly in my chest I'm afraid it'll give us away. But the paste smeared all over me seems to mask my scent, disguising my foreign smell with the earthy tones of the Australian bush. The creature hesitates, sniffing the air with confusion. It's as if it senses our presence but can't quite pinpoint where we are. Finally, after what feels like an eternity, the creature withdraws its snout from the crevice. Its frustrated growls and heavy footsteps recede as it continues its search elsewhere. Time seems to stretch on endlessly. For a moment, neither of us moves, still reeling from the close encounter. Every sound, every shift in the air sets my nerves on edge, but gradually the oppressive sense of danger begins to fade. The creature's growls and footsteps, once so menacingly close, are now distant echoes. Finally, after what feels like hours, the young man relaxes his posture slightly. His sharp gaze softens as he turns to me, nodding slightly. It's a silent signal that it might be safe to leave our hiding place. We emerge cautiously from behind the waterfall, stepping out into the cool, misty air. The sun is rising, just a sliver on the horizon, casting a soft golden glow on the rugged landscape. The immediate area is quiet, the only sound being the water cascading down the rocks. The stranger gestures for me to follow him, moving with a sense of stealth and grace that speaks of his deep familiarity with this land. We tread lightly, every step measured and deliberate alert for any sign of the creature. As we move away from the waterfall, the young man suddenly stops and crouches down. He examines the ground closely, tracing a set of tracks with his fingers. They're large and deep, unmistakably those of the creature. Taking a hesitant step forward, I clear my throat softly. Thank you, I say, my voice barely above a whisper, mindful of the lingering danger. You saved my life. I pause, waiting for any sign of acknowledgement, but he continues his examination unfazed. I try again, a bit louder this time. Can you tell me your name? Do you, do you know what that thing was we just saw? My questions hang in the air unanswered. He looks up at me with a perplexed expression, his brow furrowing slightly. In a low, cautious tone, he mutters something in a language I don't recognize. The words are fluid, rich with inflections that are unfamiliar to my ears. Garnering nothing but a blank stare from me, he returns to the tracks, his eyes widen as he picks up a piece of tattered fabric from one of the creature's paw prints. It's a small scrap, but clearly part of a garment, frayed and stained with what looks like dried blood. He holds it up, examining it closely his expression one of concern. Suddenly he turns to me and becomes animated, speaking rapidly in his native tongue. His words are a torrent of sounds and syllables that dance around me, completely foreign and incomprehensible. He points emphatically at the scraps, then to the tracks and finally towards the dense bushland. I watch him, trying to decipher his meaning through his gestures and the urgency in his voice. It's clear he's trying to convey something crucial, something about the creature and perhaps its recent activities. I'm sorry, 
I don't understand, I say, my voice tinged with frustration. Can you please just speak to me in English? It doesn't even occur to me at the time that he might not know English. He stares at me, his expression hard to read. For a moment, he seems to be weighing his options, his gaze shifting from me to the wilderness around us. Then, without another word, he turns and storms off into the bushland. His departure is swift, a clear sign of his annoyance or perhaps his need to act quickly. For a moment, I'm stunned, left standing in the early morning light, the sounds of the wilderness enveloping me. The sense of isolation is palpable, and the memory of the creature's terrifying presence is still fresh in my mind. Shaking off my hesitation, I start to follow him. My injuries protest with each step, but the danger of being alone in this environment, especially with that creature out there, overrides my discomfort. Wait, I call out, my voice echoing slightly in the open space. Catching up to him, I try to keep pace, my breathing heavy from the exertion and pain. We should stick together, I say, more to myself than to him. He doesn't stop. I notice he's not moving as fast as he could. Seems like he's consciously slowing down his pace, allowing me to follow close behind despite my injured state. He continues forward, muttering something under his breath in his language. It's a stream of words I can't understand, but the tone suggests distress. We trek through the rugged wilderness, the landscape a blur of reds and greens through my increasingly hazy vision. The throbbing in my head, a dull ache at first, grows into an insistent, pulsating pain. It feels like a drumbeat, relentless and overpowering. My steps become unsteady, each movement sending waves of nausea and dizziness through me. As we navigate the dense underbrush, my vision starts to double. The world around me splitting and merging into a disorienting dance. I blink rapidly, trying to clear my sight, but it only seems to worsen. The edges of my vision darken, the encroaching shadows narrowing my field of view. I can feel the heat of the sun on my back, the sweat trickling down my spine, but it's as if I'm moving through a thick fog. My ears ring, the sounds of the bush muted and distant. I try to focus on the young man leading the way, his figure now a nondescript silhouette in front of me. I want to call out, to tell him that something is wrong, but my tongue feels heavy, my throat dry. With each step, the pain in my head spikes, a sharp contrast to the numbness that starts to creep into my limbs. I stumble, my feet tangling into the underbrush, and my hand reaches out, grasping for support. But there's nothing to hold on to. My knees buckle, and I feel myself falling. The ground rushes up to meet me, a collision that seems both imminent and surreal. In that moment, a wave of helplessness washes over me, a sense of impending doom. But the impact never comes. Instead, there's a sudden, jarring halt, as strong arms catch me, preventing me from crashing to the earth. I barely register the sensation of being lifted, my body too heavy, too disconnected from my mind. The last thing I remember is the sensation of being carried, a steady rhythm of footsteps, a faint echo in the growing darkness of my mind. As I slowly regain consciousness, the world comes back into focus with a soft blur. The gentle sway of leaves above me creates a kaleidoscope of light and shadow. I'm lying on a bed of green foliage under a sprawling eucalyptus tree, its distinct, aromatic scent filling the air around me. I try to sit up, but a sharp pain in my head forces me back down. That's when I notice the stranger sitting beside me, his watchful eyes fixed on my face. He holds out a container, crafted from the bark of a tree, filled with clear, cool water. With his help, I manage to take a few sips, the water bringing a much-needed relief to my parched throat. He then gently examines my head, his fingers probing with a careful, practiced touch. There's a tenderness in his actions. He's collected various plants and herbs, some of which I recognize as native remedies. With skilled hands, he starts to apply a poultice to my head wound. 
The cool mixture stings at first, but soon a soothing sensation replaces the pain. Once he's done, he sits back, giving me space. His gaze wanders to the horizon, lost in thoughts I can't begin to comprehend. I take the opportunity to observe him more closely, his face etched with lines of experience, telling a story of a life lived in harmony with nature. His eyes, dark and deep, reflect a world that's both beautiful and brutal. Gathering my strength, I make another attempt to communicate with the stranger. Thanks again. My name's Willow, by the way, I say, hand outstretched. His expression remains stoic, his eyes revealing nothing. Do you understand me? I ask tentatively, my voice weak but hopeful. He watches me, his face unreadable. He doesn't respond, and it becomes increasingly clear that he might not understand English. This realization strikes me as odd. Even the most isolated Aboriginal communities have some exposure to English. As I lie there, pondering our communication barrier, I observe him more closely. His attire, his tools, the way he interacts with the environment. But it all seems, well, different. Not just traditional, but ancient, untouched by the modern world. A thought begins to form in my mind a possibility so incredible that it borders on the fantastical. Could he be from an uncontacted people? I sit up, contemplating this possibility, my mind racing. I've heard stories about the Pintupi Nine, the group of indigenous Australians who walked out of the desert in 1984, having lived in isolation from the outside world. But that was nearly 40 years earlier and the idea of stumbling upon an uncontacted tribe in Australia in 2023 seems almost as unbelievable as the monstrous creature we just encountered. And yet, as I watch him methodically tend to the surrounding area, arranging stones, checking the wind direction, and occasionally glancing at the sky, I can't help but wonder. He notices my scrutiny and meets my gaze. There's a brief moment where our eyes lock, a silent exchange. Humoring the possibility, I point to myself using slow, deliberate gestures. Willow, I repeat, tapping my chest. He watches, his expression thoughtful. Then, mimicking my action, he taps his own chest and says, Jira. My companion has a name, and it's Jira. Ecstatic at the breakthrough, my heart leaps. Jira, I repeat a smile breaking through my pain and exhaustion. It's a small connection, but it feels monumental, like a bridge across the unfathomable chasm between us. But then, a grim thought crosses my mind, casting a shadow over my brief moment of joy. Here I am, a modern woman with all the germs and microbes of a world far removed from Jira's. A sudden realization hits me hard. I could be a walking, talking petri dish of pathogens to which he might have no immunity. Memories of historical accounts where explorers and settlers inadvertently introduced diseases to indigenous populations flash through my mind. The consequences were often catastrophic. A shiver runs down my spine at the thought of being responsible for such a tragedy. I rummage through my first aid kit. My fingers, still slightly unsteady from my recent ordeal, search for a face mask. Finding one, I quickly put it on, securing it firmly over my nose and mouth. I can't completely eliminate the risk, but I can minimize it. Jira watches me with a mix of curiosity and confusion. He doesn't understand the reason behind this strange new addition to my face, but he remains silent, his eyes following my every move. I reach back into my backpack, gingerly pulling out my notebook, It's a bit damp from our earlier plunge through the waterfall, but the contents are mostly intact. Flipping through the pages, I find what I'm looking for. Photos of me in Perth. I show Jira the pictures, pointing to the tall buildings, the crowded streets, and the images of me in various urban settings. I tap the photo and then point to myself, trying to convey that this is where I come from. Home, I say slowly. That's where I'm from. Jira leans in, his eyes scanning the images with a mix of wonder and perplexity. 
He touches the photos lightly, tracing the outlines of the skyscrapers and the unfamiliar faces in the pictures. He looks up at me, then back at the photo, a flicker of understanding in his eyes. Encouraged by Jira's reaction, I flip to a blank page in my notebook. Taking out a pen, I demonstrate its use, drawing a simple outline of the terrain we're in. I then hand the pen to Jira, gesturing towards the notebook and then at the photos. I want him to draw where he's from, to share a part of his world as I've shared mine. Jira takes the pen, examining it with a curious gaze. He tentatively places the tip on the paper and starts to draw. His movements are cautious at first, but they soon become more fluid, revealing a natural talent for expression. A village emerges on the page. He had several huts, arranged in a circle, and a larger central structure that seems to be a communal area. He has a figure, presumably himself, depicted as walking away from the village. The figure is alone, separate from the other elements of the drawing, imparting a sense of solitude and departure. Well, I'm no anthropologist, but through my schooling and cultural sensitivity training as a ranger, I've learned about various aspects of Aboriginal cultures. One concept that comes to mind is that of the walkabout, a rite of passage in which young Aboriginal men embark on a journey into the wilderness, living off the land for a period to transition into manhood and gain spiritual enlightenment. As I ponder Jira's drawing, the eerie encounter with the creature still looms large in my thoughts. I decide to communicate this experience with Jira, hoping he might have some insight or knowledge about what we'd faced. I start sketching the creature as best as I can recall. The grotesque features, the scaly skin, the malevolent eyes. I try to capture every detail that's etched into my memory. My hand trembles slightly as I draw, the image stirring renewed terror. Finishing the sketch, I turn the notebook to show Jira. Do you know what this is? I ask. Well, his reaction is immediate and intense. His eyes widen and he recoils slightly, a look of recognition and fear crossing his face. He begins speaking rapidly, his voice urgent. One word stands out, repeated several times with emphasis. Bunyip. Jira's hand shakes as he takes the notebook from me, his eyes locked on the sketch of the bunyip. With a sense of urgency, he begins drawing a line from the monstrous figure to the village he'd depicted earlier. The line he draws is jagged, almost erratic, as if to symbolize the chaotic and unpredictable nature of the bunyip. He taps the line repeatedly, his eyes meeting mine with a piercing intensity. It's clear to me now why he was in such a rush. He fears the bunyip is heading towards his village, or worse, that it might already be there. So there you go, my dear friends. That is the first couple of parts of what is going to be um, a two-episode video. So hopefully I have the next one of those out for you next Friday. I am intrigued as to all hell of what's going to happen in the second part. I tell you, a uh, wonderful story. Okay, so another one set in Australia. I wrote a couple of stories myself about Perth and the outskirts a while back. And yeah, so it's nice to revisit this part of the world. Not that I've ever actually been. Been to the other side of Australia, but never around Perth or anywhere there. Thoughts, feelings, anything else you want to say in the comment section below the video. And as ever, I will do my best to join in the conversation. So yes, this will be complete next week, probably on the Friday night as well. So until the next time, my dear friends, hope you have a lovely weekend. Very, very sweet dreams and bye bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.